Okay, welcome to my first time teaching this class, Endgame Exclam, former muscle. Okay, so we're gonna look at four endgames I played before you were born. And when I say you, I mean Ben Simon, and possibly you at home. Um, and these were all different kinds of endgames, except that I won them, hooray. If I ever show a game I lost, then it's time to take me away. Um, the first game, strangely enough, is against Robert James Fisher. His middle name actually is James. Um, I don't know if he was named after him, but he's an expert master who's lived, I think, most of his life in Indiana and doesn't have anything to do with the other one except he can make legal moves. But otherwise, I guess the other one can't now. Anyway, uh, this was played in 86. And actually, this is good for an endgame class because I won a prize for this game, best endgame. The guy who gave me the prize is my friend, but I'm not the one on trial here. Um, it was $50, I remember. In 86, I thought that was a lot of money. Now I'll give you $50 to not teach the class, each one of you. Yeah. We, we agree? You, I'll, give, I'll give you 40. Okay. And you at home? Now wait, when, when another guy did it, the camera was like right here. It's wrong. Yeah, the camera was, you know, I was like, ah. Okay, so um, you were taught by some crazy teacher somewhere that when it's opposite color bishops, that means it's a draw. Okay, but I'm here to tell you the truth. It's never a draw. And when it's rook and opposite color bishops, it's always a win. Okay, even if you agree to a draw, I'm not, as a director, I'm not gonna, it's, it's gonna be a win. Okay, and here, black has many advantages. You don't just look at the bishops and go, okay, it's a draw. Obviously, my rook is better. His rook's in the corner. Okay, he's probably an REM fan. Okay, nothing. One guy pretends he got it, but he's from Canada. He'll, he'll get it like in an hour. Okay, so his rook's in the corner, and I'm in the spotlight. That's me in the spotlight. All right, now a couple more, you got it. Um, and also, my rook's pretty active. It's threatening stuff. But more important than that, because of his stupid pawn structure on the king side, um, that's not the pawn structure you want when your opponent has a white squared bishop and you don't. So I'm going to take advantage of that and take advantage of my better rook, and I'll have good winning chances. Also, I'm slightly higher rated, which I'm not sure if that's related. Okay, he played rook c1 because unlike most of you at home, he saw his bishop was attacked. Nice. If his bishop moves away, obviously I take the b3 pawn if I want. Okay, now you guys remember what I said, so you know what move I made here. Bishop b7. Bishop b7, yeah, because that's, that's not good. Okay, and I tell my private students, but I'm not going to tell you, so don't listen. Turn your volume down. When you have that pawn structure on the king side, you have to have a bishop on g2. Then you're okay. Now you have no white square control. So where's my bishop going next to move? F3. Yeah, f3, and then he can't really move too much. Okay, so king f1, threatening king e2. And king e2 is now illegal. So yeah, now he's much worse. And he played h4, putting it in h. And I played f6. And this is something most people sort of misunderstand. This is actually very easy because when you have opposite color bishops or you don't, you almost always want to put your pawns on the opposite color of your bishop. That way your bishop can move everywhere. A lot of weaker players put on the same color as their bishop because they think their bishop can defend their pawns then, which is true, but then your bishop can't move. It's good to move. Um, that's why I always sit down in a chair so I can't move. Wait. Um, so I have all my pawns on the color that I want them, green, and my opponent was very envious, so his pawns are all in red. Okay, you'll get that later when you get home. And uh, since my pawns are on dark squares, my bishop can move everywhere, and more importantly, his bishop can't move anywhere. Okay, I'm trying to restrict his bishop. Um, he's not doing a good job restricting my bishop. He's making it so my bishop can move anywhere. Okay, so my king can move up the board, and I always give the same lecture in endgames. Uh, I show the game between Irina Zenyuk and Sabina Foyzor from the 2009 U.S. Women's. I'm sure you all memorized that game. Yeah, stop laughing at home. They did. And that game, we saw a rook and knight endgame where white was a pawn up and had very good winning chances. And over the next 13 moves, black moved her king up the board, and white left her king on h1. I wonder who won that game. Oh, not the person who left their king on h1. So black won, and I show that endgame a lot. And I always tell my students, one of them would be my wife, 
move your king up the board in the end game. And then like everything else in life, I, they don't listen to me. Okay? Not that my wife never listens to me, although she doesn't. So I'm always like, move your king up, move your king up. And they're like, no. Okay, so when I play f6, not only am I restricting the bishop and putting the pawn in the right color, now my king can move up the board. I'm a grandmaster, so I can move there in one move. Might take you guys longer. Okay, my opponent played king g1, showing why his king f1 was brilliant. No, he just didn't know what to do, because my rook and bishop are dominating. Bishop to d5, attacking his pawn. Now this may surprise you at home, and in the, in the room. And it might even surprise Orlando, who doesn't know whether to push or pull. Okay, but in the end game, especially in this kind of end game, but in most kinds, there's one way to win. What's the most common way you would win an end game? Now I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint you can understand. They're, they're not going to understand it. In the first three rounds of Norway, which is ongoing, and for you at home, it ended a week ago. Is that right? Yeah. So. The first three rounds of Norway, there were 13 draws and two wins, okay, fighting tournament. And of the two wins, I'm sure you've, both you've all memorized those games. There was a game Anand Kramnik, where Kramnik won with black. And I can't remember the other game because I can't remember anything. Nakamura beat Giri. I do remember. I was lucky. Both games were won for the same reason. They are both won in the end game. What was that reason? It's the same as this one. You can guess. How do you win an end game? Do you have a mating attack by sacking four pieces? No. Somebody? Anybody? Wait, what'd you say? You might be right. I can't do that. He won't let me. I'm not playing your opponents. I'm playing this guy. This is Robert James Fisher. Come on, man. Anybody else? Taking your opponent's pawns is good, but why is that good? You make a queen. That's all you had to say. Okay, and when Kramnik was playing Anand, and Kramnik won, and when Nakamura played Giri, and Nakamura won, they both had passed A pawns. They must have learned from me. And they pushed their pawns really far, and their opponents resigned. They would have queened, but their pawn didn't want to see that. Okay, that's how you win an endgame, is you make a queen. If you don't make a queen, it's hard to win. And that's why when you're defending an endgame, and you're worse, you try to trade all the pawns. Then if your opponent doesn't make a queen, what are they going to do? Like beat you up? Well, maybe. Not him. Okay, so for example, rook and bishop versus rook in theory is a draw. And you're up a whole bishop. So if somehow he could trade all the pawns up and give his bishop up, he would be drawing in theory, not in practice. Okay, so I played bishop d5 because I want to play bishop takes b3. He played the obvious move. I think there's only one obvious move. Yeah, he has to save his pawn, so he played b4. And now when I play a4, my pawn's closer to queening. I like queening. Okay, I saw those games even though they were played 30 years later. Okay, so now this pawn is very close to queening. If only I could get rid of this pawn. I'll do anything to get rid of that pawn. You don't want to know what I'll do to get rid of that pawn. Although that was 1986, so I probably shouldn't say that. Okay, so I played a4. My opponent's like, you're not doing nothing. He played b5. And he's for keeping my pawn on here. And he's blocking all the pawns up so I can't do anything. That was very mean of him. He gave himself the b4 square for his bishop. Otherwise, his bishop couldn't move anywhere. OK, I played h5. This is called fixing. I'm fixing his pawns all in this dumb color where I can mate him eventually. If his rook ever gets active somewhere, then he has to watch out for checkmate. But if he can move his pawns on the king's side, he doesn't have to watch out. So h5, fixing his pawns on a bad color. Bishop b4, king f7, king f1. This guy's a genius. King f1, king g1, king f1. That's why he beat 20 grandmasters. Oh, wait, that was the other guy. Oh, never mind. Bishop f3, again, always repeat. King g1, rook b3, king h2, king e6, rook c3. Okay, so now I traded rooks and we drew? No. And if I trade rooks, which is not good, and then I win a pawn by force, although I can't. Maybe I can. Maybe king d5 does. OK, but we're going to cheat, because I like that. OK, I'm just going to take this pawn. I'm not even going to try. Yeah. Now you can see it's not easy for black to win, because it's impossible. Good reason. I have an extra pawn. It's useless. I can't, get up. I can't do anything. OK, so instead of trading rooks and drawing, instead of moving my rook away and losing my bishop, 
I just ignored his move. I play king d5. Okay, the problem is, if he takes my rook with the drawn opposite colored bishop ending, this pawn's even closer to queening. Okay, and actually the Indigo Girls wrote a song about this, Closer to Feingold. Wait, was that the name of the song? Yeah, they never heard of Indigo Girls. Oh well. Okay, which is actually okay in my book. All right, and then this pawn's going to queen, and when you stop it from queening, my king comes and helps. So he can, he can take my rook. So he didn't. Robert James Fisher, come on. Played rook e3, and now I took his rook, right? Did I trick you? You're from Canada, did I trick you? No, sir. What about the Cuban? No? no? Okay, somebody beat him up. No? All right. All right, so rook e3. Now I mated him with rook here and rook here. Why didn't I do that? Anybody a doctor in here? Because it's an x-ray. No. My rook is defending my bishop through his rook. So if I play rook b1, he takes my bishop. It looks good, but not too good. OK. So I play bishop e4, and that has a threat. It looks like I'm trying to mate him, and I'm trying to, you know, whoa. And I'm trying to save my bishop because he keeps attacking it. But I actually have an idea. He played king h3. Okay, that way his king is as far as possible from the pawns I want to queen. Wait, that's not good. Yeah. So that was a bad move. And now what did I do? I don't even remember what I did. I did something. Anybody have a guess? I moved my king up, I got my bishop up, I got my rook up. Wish I could queen. I would never do that. Bishop f5 check, and then I sacrifice the exchange. Right, the reason is, and your move also wins, but I wanna play king c4. But if my bishop's on e4, I probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. So, but it's, it still wins, it just would be, yeah. So then I sacrifice the exchange because I want to make a queen. Okay, that's more important than a rook for a bishop. And I finally got my passed pawn. Yeah, and as we say at the top level, that pawn's going to cost him a rook because that pawn's going to cost him a rook. But he showed me he made a lot of king moves doing nothing. That was good. Right. Now, I, again, I tell all my students every game, I have examples, move your king up in the end game. What would Gregory Kaidanov would say? He would say, how come you guys haven't heard of me? That's the first thing he would say. The second thing, in fact, he would especially say that to you. The second thing he would say is, I'm up a king. Because he said that to me once. I was playing him, and I was down two pawns in an end game, and I drew. And he's like, well, you're up a king. Of course it's a draw, even though I was down two pawns. And here I would say, I'm up a king. I have a king, and you don't. My king's doing something, your king's hanging around. Okay, so my king's winning all of your pawns, and it's helping my pawn become a, a queen. If my king was on h7, I'd probably take white, because a rook's better than a bishop. Okay, but my king's on c4, I'm up a king. I have two pieces, you have one. Okay, he played rook e7. Now, I'm really surprised I played the next move. Because as a young player in 86, I would want to make a queen. But I guess I was good, because I wasn't in a hurry. Usually weak players are in a hurry, and, and stronger players are like, yeah, whatever, I'll win later. So g6, no pawn for you. Okay, if he wants to take my f pawn and let me queen for nothing, okay. Oh, I mean, if he plays like rook f7, that's a good move. And then rook f6, whoa. And then here, okay, I'll let him take my f pawn. But, okay. And for those of you who think you can win my, you, you can prevent me from queening, think again. Bam. Okay, so he's not going to win my f pawn. He can't win my b pawn because if he attacks it, I could play king takes b5. So I'm just going to make a queen, but he can't have any of my king side pawns. Because it's possible, although very unlikely, he could sacrifice his rook for my a pawn. And if he has more pawns on the king side, that could be dangerous, although I doubt it. But here, he, I just won't let him do it. Okay, he made king f1. His king's going to beat my a pawn, right? No. no. And the truth hurts. Okay. And what's Black's next move going to be? No, Black's next oh, move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's 
King What's that? B2. Yeah, King B2, and yeah. Okay, so that was very easy. So I won by sacrificing the exchange and getting a passed pawn, but before I got the passed pawn, I had to force his pawn to B4 so I could play A4 and get a little closer. And actually, <clears throat> in a lot of openings and middle games, when I'm randomly pushing A5, A4 to soften him up, I think about, am I gonna queen that pawn in 20 moves? And then the answer is no. But if it was yes, I'd be pretty smart. Yeah. So in the end game, what are the most important things? Well, two of them, which happened here, which is why I'm lecturing, is king's, king position, moving your king up, which I did and my opponent didn't do, and getting past pawns. Those are very important. Those are more important than other things you do, like winning an exchange or having a better pawn structure. If you can make a queen, I recommend it. If your king moves up, as Gregory Kaidenov likes to say, you're up a king. All right, so I actually won $50 because of that, and I still have it. Yeah, they believe me, too. All right, this is one of my favorite games because, number one, my opponent was German. Yeah, that's the first thing. Number two, I was playing in the Netherlands, and the Dutch just love the Germans, like we all do. And uh, it was the last round, and I was having a bad tournament as usual, and my opponent was having a great tournament. Okay, so he was getting paired up, and, okay. and he needed a draw for his IM norm. And if I win, lose, or draw, it doesn't matter. I'm getting crushed every game. Okay, so we play in the last round, and I have a reputation that I've earned, although this might have been one of the starting games of it. I don't give anybody anything for a norm. So if I'm playing Carlson, and I'm black, and he needs a draw for a GM norm, he's not getting it. He's going to win instead. But he's not going to get it. I don't give anybody a norm ever. Okay, if you're higher rated than me and you need a draw, then too bad. Okay, so in the last round, I've been beaten and drawn for norms, but I don't give you a norm. I don't play 10 moves and agree to a draw. And this was one such case. I moved 10, he offered me a draw. And it was a very boring rady. It wasn't interesting. Okay, but in my opinion, I'm not only helping myself because I want to play chess. I'm helping my opponent because... I don't want him to go through the rest of his life and think, would I have drawn or won that game if he didn't give me a draw? Okay, and he didn't offer enough money either. Okay, the Deutsche Mark was weak. Anyway, so this way if he does win or draw, he knows he earned it. Okay, and I have stories about myself where I could have played a quick draw in the last round and gotten a GM norm, but I wanted to earn my norm, so I lost. No, I mean, because so I drew. Yeah, I did lose once too, it sucked. Okay, so this is the starting position of our end game. Black has um, a few advantages, okay? And usually, when you see this pawn structure, you see a pawn on c4 for white and a pawn on c6 for black. It's advantageous to both sides, depending on if they can do what they want to do. Here, I can do what I want to do, but he can't. So it's advantageous to me. The advantage for black is obvious. I can go to d4 with my pieces. He cannot go to d5 with his pieces. I mean, he can, but I'll take it, okay? So that's always the case when you see this pawn structure. However, the advantage for white, if he can achieve it, is pushing all his queenside pawns and making a queen and gaining space. So if he could play b4 and c5 and stick a knight on d6, then white has a good position. But obviously he can't do any of that. He can't play b4, can't play c5, can't play knight d6. But in the middle game, that would actually be a good plan for white. But since none of those moves are legal and lose all your pawns, this is just good for black. Um, Right now, a mild advantage I have is this pawn's defended a lot and that pawn's not. So sometimes I can get a tempo. Also, if you want to put the white knight on a good square, I don't know what square that would be, but I know the black knight can go here, and that's why I played knight f8 earlier. And if I change my mind, I can play knight c5 and attack these two pawns. So I have good squares for my knight, and he doesn't, because he can't play knight d5 and he can't play knight c4. Those would be good squares for his knight. I could play knight d4, and I could play knight c5. Okay, it's my move, because he just took on a1. So I play knight e6, for obvious reasons. He played queen b2. I think he wants to play b4, like I said. And I played knight g5, tricking him. Now I'm threatening the e4 pawn. If I play knight c5, I'm sort of blocking my queen. So, for example, if he plays queen e2, or queen c2, or queen b1, and defends his pawn, I can take on a3. So it's not easy to defend your pawn. It's tough getting an IM norm. Right? Okay. 
So he played F3, breaking my most important rule. You guys knew here? Never play F3. You guys at home knew. They knew. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm exposing his king. When you move all the pawns in front of your king, your king has no cover. Normally in an end game, you get punished because people put queens and rooks on the seventh rank and checkmate you. So you don't want to push all the pawns in front of your king because your seventh rank is open. Here, I don't have a rook, but I'll get in anyway. Okay, queen c5 check, and now he's in check. If he plays queen f2, I could take on a3, or I could play knight h3 check winning his queen, depending on whether I see it or not. 1992, I would have seen it. Now I don't know. What do you think at home? What well, you're thinking, RB, stop that. Okay. So he can't play queen f2. The reason I play queen c5, I want to infiltrate. Rawr. Okay, so he moved his king, then I went rawr. And he called the arbiter over and said, my opponent's going rawr. Okay, and the arbiter's like, yeah, he's Ben Feingold. What do you want? Okay, now I'm threatening queen takes knight. So he probably doesn't want to do, you know, let me do that. He can't move his knight anywhere here. And if he moves his knight to c2, then he's hanging his f3 pawn. If he moves his queen and defends his knight, I can probably take on b3. So the truth hurts, right? So what did he do? The answer is, I don't know. I don't remember what he did. It was 1992. Give me a break. Queen f2. All right, that's a move. Looks like I can take on b3. I hope I did. Yes. OK, so I want a pawn. I don't see what he can do about it. I don't see any defense. So two, take on b3. I'm threatening these two pawns, but that would give away this pawn. Luckily, I defended it with my queen. OK, he, had, he played queen d2. Why did he do that? What's his next move? Yeah, he wants to come in and also infiltrate. And normally, if you can start checking, you have really good chances for perpetual. h6, now you have no chances for perpetual. Man, truth hurts. Queen d3, trading queens. Now, you were all taught, not by me, by somebody, I don't know, that when you're head material, you should trade. Okay, And that's why you guys have never beaten me. Okay, you should trade bad pieces for good pieces. And queens have a special rule that I made up. I can't tell you because it's special. I'll tell you anyway. I'll tell you at home, but not them. They won't listen. Okay, you trade queens depending on whose king is safer. Queens are good for checkmating your opponent. Very useful. If your opponent's king is exposed, it's good to have a queen. If your king is the safest king ever, you don't care if your opponent has a queen. Whose king is safer? Black's king is safer, because my, my king has this nice, beautiful square on h7. His king is exposed on the whole rank. So I can check his king and, and will. So my, my queen is better than his queen, and his queen's like blocking his knight, and I'm attacking his king. So I'm not going to trade queens. However, if I was a betting man, I would bet if I traded queens, I'm still winning. But I think I'm more winning by not trading queens. So I didn't. It would have been funny if I did. It was 25 years ago. I took queen. I forgot. No? I know I didn't. So. OK, so I put him in check. And he played king f1. Always play king f1. And I took his pawn. I'm two pawns up. Yes. OK. Now you might think, why did he do that? Why didn't he play king to g1 and defend his h pawn? Well, then I check. And if he goes here, I have mate with advantage. And after king h1, let's see how smart the audience is. What's that? Knight f2 check wins. I wonder if queen f2 wins more. When you see a good move, look for a better one. I mean, I probably would have played that and not cared. But I wonder if this threatening queen g1 mate is better. Yeah. Anyway, it's not good for white. Okay, so he didn't do that. He played king f1. And I took. Now I'm two pawns ahead. Okay, he checked. I went to safety. And he took my pawn on b6. Now I'm one pawn ahead. And I played knight h3. And knight h3 doesn't have an immediate threat because he's defending. But it stops his queen from taking either one of my pawns. So I'm preventing his queen from doing anything because his queen has to stop queen f2 mate. And I'm still threatening g3. You can see whose king is safe for now in case you didn't know before. Now you know. Okay, g4, stopping queen takes g3. Knight f4 with obvious threats. 
And I remember one of my students, I think it was today. Was it today? Was it yesterday? I think it was one of them. I was explaining that this is a very bad pawn structure because you can put something on f4 and it stays there forever. Man, a knight on f4, that's pretty good. I couldn't think of a better piece. That's the best piece I would want on f4 here is a knight. Better than a queen. Okay, now I'm threatening everything. I wish I was threatening more, but okay, probably am. And he played queen f2, stopping my threats. Again, most of you would trade queens because you're up a pawn. Obviously, my queen's better than his. Check. King g1. H5. Okay, get rid of the defense of his king. He has to take because he can't lose a pawn. And I play queen e6. So I'm threatening this pawn, I'm threatening this pawn, and I'm threatening knight h3 check. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Okay, and that's why I played h5, so my queen could get it sort of everywhere. Knight h3 check's probably more important than the other threats. Remember I was telling you that my queen's better than his, and I had my pom-poms out and everything? And I was like, yes, queen. Actually, I didn't say it, but hasn't my knight been much better than his the whole game? His knight hasn't moved, has it? Yeah, terrible, my knight's on like the best square ever. Okay, he played queen c5, preventing knight h3 winning and preventing queen takes c4. And I played queen d7, because I want to play queen d2 or queen d1. He played king f1 defending his knight, and I checked him. King f1 actually loses material, but I can see why he didn't want me to, to come in here, because then he would lose immediately. Okay, queen check. And let's see who the tactical genius in the audience is. Could be Ben Simon. First time you ever called that, right? Yeah, how does black win immediately? I can't mate him, but I can take all of his pieces. And if you're taking notes, take all of your opponent's pieces. Although actually my lesson today with one of my students, I told him not to do that. True story. He said he still made all of his opponents. I said, don't take everything, just leave one thing left. I never realized that the, when I started this game, from some position, his knight never moved. Wow. Yeah, that's not good. Oh, you check if the knight then he takes one position. Yeah, then the audience agrees with you. Yeah. 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 So I checked, he defended his knight, and I took it. The truth hurts. Yeah. Yeah. And then he resigned rather than play this ending, where I'm I'm pretty confident here. Because yeah, positional, you know, my pawn's on c6. Okay, so he resigned after queen takes knight. So in that game, my king was safer, my queen was better than his queen, my knight was better than his knight. And he got no counterplay. Whenever he tried to check me, I played h6, and king h7 tucked my king away. And his king was open forever. He moved his h-pawn, his g-pawn, his f-pawn, and his e-pawn. So his king was a little suspicious. And you might think, it's an end game, the king is fine. Well, unless I mate you. And you all like queens and knights better than queens and bishops, even though I don't, so there you go. That's for you guys. And no norm for him. The Germans bought me beer, and I'm not even kidding. I'm only kidding a little, but I'm not. Okay, and this guy was named Win, and he lost. Man, chess is hard. Maybe he's from Canada. Okay, so this is from an exchange King's Indian where my opponent played an inferior line and gave me the two bishops. Okay, and I never liked the two bishops until I got the Grandmaster title, and bam, two bishops. I was like, yes. Okay, and here, white has two advantages. One we've talked about, one we haven't. Okay, white has the two bishops advantage. Okay, because I have two bishops and he doesn't. And when you have two bishops, as I've said in many lectures before, one of your bishops is the same color. We both have a white squared bishop. And my bishop has no counterpart, so that's the bishop that's going to annoy him. Okay, and I know about annoying. I've been married three times. Okay, yeah, you, the audience is like, yeah. Okay. So the truth hurts. Now, I have another advantage, and that is my king is doing something, and his king is at home where he doesn't do anything. So my king can walk up the board. And I have a third advantage, which we talked about last game. And last game was a disadvantage. Now it's an advantage. Yay. Which I didn't realize. Man, what a smart teacher. My pawn's on c4, and his pawn's on c6. In the last game, that was good for the pawn on c6. I could play knight d4, he couldn't play knight d5. Here, my pawn on c4 actually stops knight d5, and I control d4. And I don't have to play knight d5 because I don't have a knight. So I don't care about that. 
But what I do care about is pushing all of my pawns and making a queen. And if I'm going to push my queen side pawns and make a queen, I like this pawn structure because my pawn's on c4. So I can start pushing all of my pawns and making a queen. You might not believe me, but I did it. So you can believe me. All right. First of all, when I'm playing chess, I stop my opponent's counterplay. So what's the scariest move black can play here? It's not too scary, but it is the scariest. I guess you guys don't scare easy. You guys are like, I'm not scared of nothing. What's the most aggressive move black can play? Rook d3 check is aggressive, but hangs the rook. I know you didn't mean that. You meant knight a4 check. Okay. Now, I would like to kick your knight off of, a, of b6, but c5 gives away the d5 square. That they would take my title away. If I played c5, Fide would come and say, like, okay, you're, you're like 2100 now. Okay. Even 2100 wouldn't play c5. Okay, so I want to play a5. Okay, kick his knight out. So the first move I played was b3. Yeah. Now he can't play knight a4. My c4 pawn is protected again, and I can play a4, a5. And if you try to stop me by playing a5, I might take your knight. I might not, but I probably would. Okay, so b3 is the first move. He played f6, breaking my rule. Never play f6. a4, as advertised. Knight c8, because I'm going to play a5 anyway. And I did. So I have more space, and that pawn structure, which was bad for white the previous game, is now good for white. I'm getting space, and he's stopping moves I don't want to play. I don't want to play knight d5. I don't have a knight. a6. If he never plays a6, then his knight can't really do a lot of stuff because his pawn's hanging. So he's like, okay, a6, and my knight can do whatever I want. It's all blocked up. I'm going to draw. And I was like, quiet, we're playing. King b4. I told you to activate your king, but you didn't believe me. But I'm going to do it anyway. King f7. Rook d1. Now, if I want to move my king up the board, I think I should get rid of his rook because I might get mated or not be able to legally get through. So we did. Bishop e4, I saw my pawn was attacked. h4, gaining space. g4, gaining more space. King c5, as advertised. And now, I don't want to say I have a king and he doesn't, but my king's better than his. And my king is stopping his knight from moving. Okay, And also his bishop can't really move too many places. And I have more space on both sides of the board. So if a grandmaster was in the, in the room here, they would be like, oh boy, better king, more space on both sides, two bishops. And I would be like, get a Kleenex and start, stop salivating. Okay, if you're a lower rated player, you're like, ah, three against three, three against three, equal draw. Okay, uh, the stronger you are at chess, the more you like white's position. Okay, so like Magnus Carlsen, Vladimir Kramnik, this is what they dream about. I don't know what you guys dream about. This is what they dream about. Okay? And if they were in the room now, they would be like, well, if I was black, I'd resign. But white has every advantage you could have. Two bishops, better king, more space on both sides of the board. And the knight on c8 can't move. Bishop on b1 can't really move too much either. And then Kramnik would say something like, you have the dark squares. And I'm like, what? Okay. Okay. So bishop d3, he did move his bishop. And I attacked it. Bishop f4. Bishop c2. Yeah, his bishop's not the best. b4, b5. The problem with this position is if pawns get traded, it's very difficult to defend b7. So if my king gets there or my bishop gets there, I'm going to queen my a pawn. Man, I like queening my a pawn. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so takes, takes, and bishop e4. I don't care about this pawn, I care about this pawn. Okay, it's very difficult to defend this pawn here. And once that pawn is gone, my king and bishops and a pawn are gonna win the game. Now again, as I said in the last, and the first position we did, the fewer pawns that are on the board, the more likely it's a draw. Unfortunately for him, I have two bishops. I know how to mate with two bishops. If I had two knights, and he got all my pawns off the board by sacking all of his pieces, I would have two knights and I wouldn't win. Okay, as in the game, it's Karpov Korshnov, who was 78 or 81. I think it was 78. There's a world championship match where 
Korshnoi was much worse, but he drew by giving all of his pieces away, and Karpov had two knights. And he's like, well, where's my bishop? Okay. I can make you with bishops. So the problem with him is, if he gives up all of his pieces for my past pawns, I can still win. Okay. And also, if he takes my H pawn, I'm going to call the arbiter and be like, how did he do that? So my H pawn's pretty safe. I'm not worried about losing that. Okay, knight a7, I took, hooray. Bishop c8, bishop d5 check. You guys would trade because you always trade. I never trade. Bishop b8, that's a nice knight that he has. a6. And I take his b pawn because he has counterplay. a7, what did he play? You guys can do it. He didn't resign. Knight, knight takes a7, I can win. Knight b6. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, luckily there's two sides of the board. So, yeah. And my king can go either way. Whichever way your king goes, I'll go the other way. It's too bad for him. Yeah. And this was pretty easy. Bishop e3 is a funny move. It traps his knight, Fisher style. Bam. His knight's not too good now. And now, the winning plan, which everything wins, but this is the funniest winning plan. You guys deserve humor, right? That's why I play bishop e3, so you can't play knight f4. Yeah. And okay, obviously, this is a good winning plan too, but it's not as funny. Yeah. And even less funny is this. It's, that's not funny at all. Yeah. And normally, the lower rated you are, you like knights more than bishops. Then as you improve your game, you like bishops more. You guys probably aren't there yet. And when you see it like this, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess bishops are better. Okay, and bishops aren't always better, but when they are better and you see it, you're like, man, knight's no good. Okay, bishops can dominate knights like that in a lot of end games, especially if you know Fisher's games. Not the Fisher that I played, the real one. Yeah. And Fisher has a lot of famous endings where his bishop beats the knight. He just, well, the knight can't move. Okay, so bishop e3, I was a good player then. Now I would just sit there and my flag would fall, but bishop e3, yeah. And now he's super resigned. I got two points. That's a new rule. You can just, I super resign. I can't believe how bad my game is. And I get two. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And also he changed his name after this game because, you know, for obvious reasons. Okay. And last but not least, this is the most boring game I've ever played, ever, that I ever will play. It was against Ryan Porter, who I, I think quit chess. If he didn't, he should have. This was in the US Open in Chicago, where I tied for first. Although it was in Rosemont, but I don't want to hear the details. And I had seven wins and five draws. The US Open used to be 12 rounds. What am I, the used to police? And I was a strong IM, and he was a high expert, low master. Okay, and we got the most boring position ever, this one. And this is from what opening? I've had this kind of position a lot, because from the same opening. Anybody? Who? Sicilian? Yes. You know what kind of Sicilian? Dragon. Yes. What kind of dragon? Speak quickly. Accelerated. Very good. Okay. Really strange for Canadian. Accelerated. Okay. So, accelerated dragon. And recently, I played bishop d4 check because his king is good on h1, except it's not good. Okay. And he played rook c1. Did I give him the c file? No. Am I going to play rook c7? What am I, you? And did I trade? Is that what I do? So I didn't give him the C file and I didn't trade. So what did I do? I resigned. No. Okay, I did what John Nunn calls a collinear move. Bam. Hard for humans to see, he said. Ah, you guys are proving you're human. Good job. What's that? Uh, you're two thirds correct. Rook C5. Rook C5, yeah. Bishop C5 is not collinear, that's just retreating. Okay, but Rook C5. Now, my goal here is to make the position asymmetrical. Because if it's a draw, then he'll be like, I drew a better player. And I'm like, no. So if it's really, really, really boring and there's nothing going on, it'll probably be a draw. But if the position's asymmetrical, we can both make mistakes. The big advantage black has here, and the computer doesn't think black has a big advantage, but when humans play, it's much better to be black here, is my king potentially can move up the board, as you will see. And his king, not, not as good. Okay, and if my king gets up the board to d4, d3, I, I win. Okay, and he played the move. He didn't play a move? I thought he did. 
I, I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. Okay, he played bishop d3, doing nothing. And I played f5. Not because I want to play f5, although I do. I want to move my king up. And it's hard to move your king up here. Okay, and I want the game to be asymmetrical. I want stuff to happen, so he has to think. He played g3. In this position, I was surprised. I looked at this with an engine, and not a 1994 engine. Then I might have beaten it. Um, the engine today, pretty smart. It says, man, the king on h1 is bad. So what does it play here? Matt Larson would know. That's a hint. You guys know Matt Larson? Yeah. What do you guys do all day? You go to work? Well, you guys were here all day playing outside. You must have heat stroke. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, yeah the highest rated player got it right. Shocking. What'd you say? G4. G4. Yeah. Because after G4, you can play King G2. Okay. And also after G4, if I play F5 and we trade all the pawns off the board, that's hard to win. Okay. But he didn't mind if I played F5, and he didn't mind if his king was on H1. So I, we obliged each other. He played g3 because he wants to play king g2. Now g4 loses a pawn. So. Okay, takes, 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 takes. And now the obvious move. And the obvious move, and you should always do this in chess if you can, don't let your opponent do what he wants to do. So if he wants to go to the bathroom, hold him down. Wait, you with the right answer. Right, Shirov style, but 20 years before. Except my bishop's not hanging. Does anybody get that? No, one of you? Wait, that game was played bishop h3? Yeah. Who was he playing? Ah, I think I know the answer. I don't yeah, I do know the answer. You know Claudia? Uh, I don't remember. No? I believe it was Topolov. Yeah, I think so. Bishop h3, x clam. OK, now his king's really good. OK, especially in bug house. I don't have 100 mates in one here. Oh, well, yeah, I do. Yeah. Do I have 100? No, I'd like 20. Okay, so his king can't move, but mine can. Hooray for me. That's why I played bishop d4 before this position happened. And the computer says white's fine, because computer defends perfect. And you have to realize something that's hard for you to realize. I don't really blame you, not professional chess players for the most part. When the computer says all zeros, it's equal, that doesn't mean it's equal. That means if two supercomputers are playing each other and they both play perfect, it's a draw. But it means, like here, if black plays badly, it'll be a draw. If white plays badly, you, you'll see what happens. And badly is easy to do when you can't move anything. Then you're like, what do I do? Do I play a4? Do I chill? Do I play bishop e2, bishop f3, bishop g2, and get my king out? Do I just do nothing and black can't break through? If you're a supercomputer, you look 30 moves ahead and you do the right thing. And if I'm black, I can do whatever I want and draw. I have 0% losing chance. So any grandmaster wants black here, and the supercomputer's like, I could draw this. Yeah, good luck. So he played bishop d2. I played bishop b6, so he can't activate his bishop on a5. Can I move my king up? And he traded pawns. My pawn's hanging, so I defended it. You could write that down if you're taking notes. Okay, bishop b5, I think was a really bad move. Is that right? No, I think it's okay. Okay, g5, bishop d3, bishop g4. What's the threat? Checkmate. The truth hurts. Bishop f3 mate. Now I have another threat, which isn't much of a threat, but it's a threat. I would like to win your a pawn, because as this lecture has proven, when you queen your a pawn, you win. Right? But bishop f3 is more important. It's mate. So he played king g2, and I threatened his pawn. OK, now he made the losing move. During the game, I thought I was completely winning here. The computer's like, nah, blood white's fine. OK, but he made a move that he is losing after that. The computer says, after bishop b5, white's fine. And during the game, I was like, well, I play g4, and then I play bishop f3 check and take this pawn. OK, and I assume. That's what my opponent thought. So, and I don't know why that's wrong. It looks good to me. Okay, and the computer's like, nah, white's fine. But he didn't like that. I don't blame him. So he muddied the waters, finally. And we got a really complicated position, and he was worse. So then the game was pretty easy at that point. Um, he played e5, and the idea is obvious. He's going to take this, and he's going to trade pawns, and so forth. Naturally, 
if it's somehow he can take all of my pawns and sacrifice a bishop, it would be two bishops against one bishop, you, you don't win that. Okay, two bishops don't beat a bishop. Two bishops can beat a knight, they usually do. They almost always do. And, if, and practically, they always would. Maybe a supercomputer could defend reasonably well. But two bishops never beat a bishop. So e5 is very practical, because if I win a pawn and he trades all the pawns, I won't win. Okay? So he's trying to trade all the pawns. So I played bishop b3, which I thought was super precise, but the computer prefers bishop a4. Stupid computer. Okay. And he took, and I took, and he got on a check, and I checked him again, and I took, and he played bishop c2 because he didn't want to lose his a pawn. I agree. So if he takes my e pawn, I'll attack his pawn and take it. And he thought that pawn was important. I don't really blame him. And I played bishop c7, and I'm a pawn ahead, and I have a passed pawn. And we can sit here and argue for an hour, because I get paid by the hour. Say, let's vote. I'm guessing 50-50. If there's an odd number, I still guess 50-50. Okay, and then we'll have uh, Mike Pence break the tie. Are both of those pawns passed, or just the e5 one? Man, they're afraid to answer. Ben Simon, you're important. What do you think? Yeah, this is, I, I, He's like, oh, God, I don't know. I was taught as a child, if a pawn can't be stopped by another pawn that's passed, and they meant your opponent, here you could argue that your pawn stops your pawn. Okay, so I would say it's two passed pawns, but I don't know. Okay, and since I, I'm playing it, I have two passed pawns. If I was white, I would say one. No, I'm kidding. Am I kidding? Okay, so I have at least one passed pawn, and my opponent's king is very suspicious. He's not active in the center, he's not active anywhere, and his king is defending both of these pawns. So if he starts moving his king around, he's gonna lose more pawns. But keeping your king on h3 the whole game isn't the best. Okay, king g3, walking into check. King f2, my e pawn's hanging, I took the g pawn, and I play bishop d7, because I want to take the a pawn, and he defended it, and I played g4. Some of you are confused, why aren't I taking this pawn? Do you know why? Yeah, because this pawn, yeah, right. Yeah, that pawn's important. So I fix his pawn so it can't move. But it only can't move if you know the en passant rule. If you don't know it, it can move. So if you play h4, I could take it. The computer will actually let me. It's amazing, computer's smart. Although it could be bishop h2 is stronger. Okay, but I would take it. Okay, so I'm fixing, fixing his pawn on a bad square, and uh, I'm fixing a hole where the rain gets in. All right, can I say that and not get sued? Now you can delete it. Okay, so king g2 defending his pawn, bishop check. His king's just great, and king e6. So I'm up a pawn. My pawn is further advanced than his pawn. This is a passed pawn, and my king's better than his. So I got a lot of advantages. The disadvantage is, if he sacrifices a bishop for my pawns, I don't win. The fewer pawns you have, you gotta watch it. And you have to think about that. If you're like, well, he won't take a pawn, I win a piece. If you don't have any pawns left, then that's exactly what they'll do. But I have enough pawns. Okay, bishop e1, king d5. Amazing, I'm moving my king up. Wow. Defended my pawn, moved my king up. And the truth hurts. And as Kaidnov would say, I have a king and you don't. Okay, and now I have a plan everybody can understand. Yeah, good plan. Okay. And he understood it well, so what did he do? Yeah, he resigned. But I like the end of this game. It reminds me of the Zenyuk game that I lecture on a lot. Look at my king and look at his king. And he did move his king a lot, like my first opponent, Fisher, but he kept it like on his side of the board, sort of in the corner. And I moved my king up the board. Okay, and obviously there were reasons why that happened, but you always want to move your king up the board because then you have a king. And if your opponent mates you, I didn't tell you nothing. Leave me alone. It wasn't my fault. Okay, it's funny. I was playing Judith Polgar in 1988 or 89. I'll never know. I think it was 88, but I'm not sure. Actually, I think it was 89 now. It was in Belgium where I was living, and she was, I don't know, 13, so she was better than me. And... We played a game 15, and she played the King's Gambit. And there's no score of this game. It was 15 minutes, we didn't keep score. So. And she was better the whole game. 
Yeah, we got to a double rook ending. And she moved her king up, because you move your king up in the end game. And then I mated her. She missed mate and won, so I played mate. And there was a huge crowd. You think they're rooting for me or her? I'll give you a hint, it wasn't me. So when I mated her, man, they all walked away grumbling. And they're furious, right? And she was like, yeah, okay, you get mated sometimes. So when you walk your king up the board, you might get mated, but, but not here, because my pawn has no pieces. Yeah. But usually in an end game, walking your king up is a good idea. If your pawn has queens and rooks, I, did, I didn't say nothing. But when there's just minor pieces on the board, if I'm up a king, then I'm doing well. So that was a really boring position, and I had some minor advantages that supercomputers don't care about. But when you're playing a human, if they let your king get active, if they get their pawns attacked, if their king is trapped, it's hard to play. And my king was never trapped. I was just walking up the board. And he was trying to figure out what to do, and eventually he cracked according to the engine. He could have defended better, but when you lose, you could always defend better. Right, Ben Simon? Like, Ben Simon could film better, but he doesn't. He's like, you know, call me up. Can I take the day off? And I'm like, never. That's true. You know the last time he filmed? He doesn't know either. It's been two weeks. Are you guys shocked? The, the truth hurts. Yeah. Is, this all, is this all getting edited? Yeah, that's, good, that's a good point. Yeah. Any questions? OK, so to, what's the word? To finish? That's not the word. Who speaks English in here? Not you, not you. Conclude. Yeah, to conclude. Who said that, you? Yeah. Wow, and you showed up late. Good job. Yeah. To conclude, in the end game, move your king up, push your past pawns, get past pawns. Okay, if you don't have past pawns, you ain't gonna win. Because you, you don't queen, are you gonna, am I gonna main with the bishop? I mean, I could, but that's gonna be hard. He has to put his king here, I put my king here, and then mate. I don't think that's gonna happen, is it? So if you have minor pieces, you're not gonna mate your opponent, but you can make a queen, then you can mate your opponent. So you need past pawns in the ending, you need an active king, and then you can win. In the opening, don't move your king up the board unless you're playing me. Then, yeah, okay. All right. And then my favorite conclusion, you guys can do it. Man, what a class. Yeah, class is dismissed. Even at home they did it. Yeah. All right.